So there's an old saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, it is not incumbent upon me to disprove extraordinary claims of supernatural beings doing miraculous and magical activities. It is, upon, it is incumbent upon the person making those claims to prove their contentions. What I'm bringing forth in my objections is actually a common sense perspective, a scientific evaluation based on what we do have, not what we might have or what may be. Uh, I'm not claiming that, for example, the Greek son of God, Hercules, whose life resembles that of Jesus Christ in, in many ways, is actually a real historical figure. So my, my burden of proof is, should not be greater than that of the people who are making their extraordinary claims for supernatural and miraculous beings. What we don't find is this person who appears as some sort of specter within that, that historical tableau called Jesus. He doesn't have a mark at all. Now that is a dilemma for those who believe in him because on the one hand he supposedly overturned the, the world, it turned the world upside down and triggered off this massive movement, but on the other hand he leaves no trace in the historical record. People think, oh why would anyone write a myth? But it's the language of the ancient world. So it's like asking why do people write science fiction stories? Why did someone make the Matrix? Well because it's a powerful story which transforms you when you come into contact with it. And it is made up of little motifs which have been taken from all over the place, put together in a new order. Well, that's what myth is in the ancient world. That's what the Jesus story is. Once literalist Christianity had been adopted by the Roman Empire, it, it was forced almost by its own logic to turn on the ancient mysteries. Because once you've got this idea that one man has come and is literally the Son of God, and you must literally believe in that history to be saved, well, you're almost duty-bound to enforce it. And the tolerance, spiritual tolerance, which marked out the ancient world, ended. And the pagan mysteries were eradicated, uh, the Jews were attacked, and the other forms of Christianity, Gnostic Christianity, were also eradicated and their books burnt and you know in some ways the head the intellectual head was cut off the western world it collapsed really and the heart was torn out too but christian theologians scholars and historians tend to rely on less evidence for proofs of their faith than for the comparative religion and mythology that I'm describing. In other words, they will dun me with requests for evidence for every single detail, as much as I can provide, mountains and mountains of it in a variety of languages, as far back as you can get to the most modern period. And this is all, this is what I do actually. I collected as much as I can find from around the world in as many cultures as possible, dating back as far into antiquity as we possess, all the way up to the most modern research, to show these motifs, to show these origins of various ideas that we find in the New Testament. Now, that is the burden of proof that has been requested of my particular perspective of reality, my thesis. And on the other hand, however, in order to convince themselves that 2,000 years ago, the God of the cosmos came to Earth through the womb of a young virgin girl of a particular ethnicity, performed miracles like healing the blind, walking on water, and raising the dead, uh, transfiguring on a mount, calming a storm, uh, being crucified himself, obviously, and that resurrecting himself from the dead and ascending into heaven, they require, well, pretty much no proof, no evidence, other than the New Testament. A few books, uh, a few hundred pages, that's all they require. And yeah, so that standard is really quite low. There are no 
uh, physical artifacts from the first century. We don't have any autographs or originals of the Gospels or the epistles. We have no evidence in the literary record of the existence of the canonical Gospels as we have them before the end of the second century. In other words, they're not quoted verbatim anywhere before that. They don't appear in the historical record. Nobody mentions them. Uh, we have no evidence showing that they really were written by the people whose, in whose names they are presented. We don't even really have any evidence that those particular individuals, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, actually lived as they're depicted in the New Testament. In fact, we barely have evidence that Paul, St. Paul lived. There is, the stories that are told about him where he's brought before Caesar, he's uh, rampaging with hundreds of troops, uh, he's in a, a shipwreck, he escapes from a prison in Rome. All of these fairly significant events do not make it into the historical record in any way, shape, or form. And so there's no uh, physical artifacts, as I say, from the time that this happened. There's no information in any writings of the day, contemporary writings. And so there really is absolutely no evidence for this entire story other than the New Testament. Is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and performed the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. It should be said, although it's kept from the believe in millions, theologians have cast doubts on the official story for more than a hundred years. There used to be a huge amount of evidence, historical evidence for Jesus. There, there was evidence of the cross, there was evidence of the nails that he was held by the, to the cross with. You know, now why is it that this sort of evidence is no longer presented as evidence of Jesus. It worked for hundreds of years. Well, of course, we know the answer. It was all fraudulent. It was all manufactured by the church to encourage belief in their fairy story. Now, that has all now been whittled away, apart from certain backwaters. The Gospels are not analogous to history, they are analogous to historical fiction. In other words, a drama has been, has been inserted into an historical setting. The emphasis is totally different. The, the, it's it's, it's, it's an, an unreal drama. If you think about the Gospels, they are almost primarily concerned with the last week of Jesus' life, the Passion. You know, it is, that is, takes up most of the material. It is simply a drama inserted into a, a, a more or less realistic historical background. What I, what I think we can say regarding the Gospels is that they show a decided pro-Roman bias. When literalist Christianity turned on the ancient traditions, what we're witnessing really is the collapse of the Western world and the entry into what we appropriately call the Dark Ages. Every culture in the ancient Mediterranean 
seems to have taken this perennial myth, which probably originated in Egypt, or could be so old it's Neolithic, and has made it its own, turned, had its own version. And what we see happening is that the story of Joshua or Jesus becomes merged with this pagan story of a pagan dying and resurrecting God man. So we know, for instance, in Alexandria, which is the New York of the ancient world, yes, it's full of 25% uh, of the population is Jewish. They all, they're speaking Greek. Greek is the universal language. And we know that they're putting together Jewish mythology with pagan mythology because we have lots of these texts which are called intertestamental texts because they fall between the Old and the New Testament which are clearly mythological texts which have got show a pagan Jewish crossover. If you free yourself from your preconditioning and you pick up the gospel story you can clearly see that this is another one. These pagan myths have been merged with the mysteries of Moses and Joshua, which told the story of going to the Promised Land, which was a Gnostic initiatory myth for the Jews, which is then being mixed with this pagan story. And also, we're talking, if we're talking about the non-biblical evidence, supposedly, of Jesus Christ's existence, which... Uh, to look at the historical record of the day. We, we look at the horse historical record of when this supposedly happens, you find nothing. That might be very shocking to people who have been told that Jesus Christ was the most famous person who ever lived. The New Testament itself has some two dozen scriptures in which Jesus is touted as being famed wide and far. He's uh, doing miracles that are shocking people. 500, you know, 1 Corinthians, 500 people saw him resurrected uh, at his death. There were earthquakes, the sun darkens, the saints rise up out of the ground, and they wander through the streets of Jerusalem. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. None of this finds its way into the contemporary record. And you have to wonder why. You can't just say, oh, provide me all kinds of evidence for this and that, but I'm satisfied with none for this. You know, th this is not scientific. You must sit and say to yourself, why isn't this in the historical record of the day? There were people writing at the time. It's called one of the best documented periods in history. They were very eloquent writers, and they certainly would have noticed, even if they took no notice of some rabble-rousing guy who was rampaging through the streets and going into the temples and leading great crowds and feeding 5,000 with fishes and loaves and all, the, you, know, you would think someone would mention him. But even if they didn't mention him, you would think someone would notice the other issues that were going on at the time. The temple veil is rent in its midst uh, when, when Jesus is crucified. That means that there was damage to the temple. Now that should have been recorded somewhere. The Jews were very possessive and very protective of their temple. Uh, if somebody had come in there, you know, I mean even earlier in the story, he threatens to throw the temple down. You'd think they'd be writing about this guy. What a knucklehead. He's threatening us, and yada, yada. He's calling us sons of Satan. He, you know, he's criticizing. You would think somebody would notice that and be grousing about it. There's more chaos, war, pollution now than ever before in our recorded history. Of course, we might have known uh, period with even worse conditions, but the Christians burned all the records that could tell us about it anyway. Like in the library of Alexandria, wherever the Catholics or Protestants or the Christians came, they destroyed the culture, they ruined the culture, they burned the culture, and they burned the records of these cultures. That includes the European cultures, that includes African cultures, Asian cultures, American cultures, Wherever they were, they destroyed everything. They want to replace our culture with Americanization, with the, you know, the Judeo-Christian cultures. The, the Christianity is the root to all problems in the modern world. It's hard to know what to do to oppose something. In, uh, because uh, 
dissident voices are not tolerated in the contemporary society. Everybody can relate to Odin and Thor and Freya in Norway. Because it's our religion. We are not Christian. Christianity is a Jewish religion. Christianity was originally a Jewish sect. Baptism is all about a symbolic ritual murder of the non-Jewish, of the Gentile. That they murder the Gentile child. And then they call the Jewish name that's supposed to replace the pagan soul. Religion was very important in the Roman world. Although they had a, a secular dimension to their life, religion was all pervasive in the sense that gods and their shrines were everywhere. They, there was no question in the minds of nearly everybody at that time that there were gods. Gods made their presence felt all the time, whether it be in earthquakes or thunderstorms, in, 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 in diseases and so on. Gods were ever present. The one thing you had to do with a god was keep them on your side. You made a sacrifice, you hoped that their capricious behaviour wouldn't fall badly on you. Religion also was very tolerant in the Roman system. The Romans and all polytheists embraced the idea that, there were, that, that divinity was divided, that there were gods of many different descriptions. When the Romans conquered a province, they didn't try and annihilate their religion. They didn't insist that they adopt Rome's religion. They merely uh, took that religion into their system. They merely uh, assimilated it, allowing that what you call a god by one name, we call by another name. And they had no problem with that. If you think of the most impressive temple that stands in Rome, the Pantheon, it was the temple to all the gods. They, they had no exclusivity about it. You had to keep all the gods, or as many of them as you could, on your side. Now, the only time that Rome seems to have had a problem are the two ends of the empire, with the Druids in Britain and the Jews in, in, in Palestine. You know, that's where the Rome, Rome came against uh, 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 oppositional re religions. Now, with the Druids, they just annihilated the Druids. They, they destroyed their shrines uh, and ended the... the, the any, it probably existed underground, but essentially they erased that religion. Now, this was the big problem for Judaism when it had fell foul of Rome as a result of not one but three rebellions. You know, things Jewish were not viewed favourably. And that's why here is a big, the big kickstart for Christianity moving further into the Roman world. It's a quirk of history that we're not here discussing whether there was and wasn't a real Mithras. Because very nearly Mithraism, which is a Persian cult, you know, which is again a foreign cult to the Roman Empire, became the dominant cult in, in, across the whole of the ancient world under the Romans. Uh, they tried that. They tried numbers of, they didn't go straight to Christianity, they tried numbers of things which didn't, didn't gel, didn't work. Each emperor would come across with their own thing. And this is how, partly how all of this un, uh, began to, um, the traditional history fell to bits, was that in the, after the Reformation, Protestant scholars were looking at the Catholic Church, which they just split from, and going, hang on, all of these uh, rites and rituals and, and the, the, the Pope, and, this is all pagan. And so it was, it started with the Reformation and, and, and you then had for the first time scholars actually examining the texts, free to do it, and examining the rituals. For them, they were looking for the real Jesus and were peeling away what they thought were accretions to find the real man. All that's happened is that Peter, Gandhi and I and other scholars have carried on that tradition, I mean, Albert Schweitzer, you know, his great example, and gone right down and gone, do you know what? you keep going and there's no one underneath this. Even, uh, you know, the persecution, the supposed persecution of the Christians by Paul, who was Saul at the time, that doesn't make it into the historical record. And it's not like, like I say, it was only a 90 mile stretch of territory. It's not like this was off on Mars or something. It, it's a small area. And by that time, as I say, there was plenty of construction going on there. It's a crossroads going down from the uh, European continent 
into Egypt, there was a lot of traffic going through there for many centuries. This is not some isolated area. There would be plenty of people passing through who would have heard these stories, who would have been amazed, who would have gone into another part of the country or into Egypt. Or So the first time I heard the concept that Jesus never existed, I was a Christian man. And I was like, man, what you talking about? You atheists are talking some bullshit now. Obviously, Jesus existed. He's one of the great historic figures, man. We know he was real. Now, maybe you could possibly say that he was just a man and he wasn't the savior they claimed him to be. But you definitely can't say that he didn't exist. That's ridiculous. So I went out researching for myself, and I hope you do the same thing. Because if you do, you'll find out what I found out. There is absolutely no historical fucking evidence that Jesus existed, period. Not a single person wrote a single word about him during the time he supposedly lived. Not a single painting, not a single artifact. He didn't write anything himself down. In fact, there were scholars in the area that he supposedly was during that time who kept track of all the cults in the area, and not a single one of them mentioned him, period. In fact, there's no Roman records at all that Pontius Pilate put him to death. And if you go research it yourself, you'll find out that no one wrote a single word about Jesus down for decades and decades and decades after he supposedly died. And the very first piece of historical evidence that Christians give to try to prove Jesus actually lived is a writing from a guy named Josephus. Well, here's the thing. Josephus wasn't even alive when Jesus was supposedly crucified. He wasn't even born yet. So there's no possible way that he could have laid eyes on Jesus at all. So this is not historical evidence, period. At best, you would consider that hearsay. But here's the thing. We now know that this very best piece of evidence that Christians give that Jesus was a real man is a total forgery. It was forged in the fourth century by a guy named Eusebius, which was an early church father. Eusebius, in the 4th century, forged Josephus' writings to make it look like Jesus was an actual man. This is what the church does time and time again. They have absolutely no evidence to back up any of the bullshit they try to brainwash you with, so they forge evidence. You'll find this over and over and over again. This is what they do. So then when you go research it and find out that Josephus was a forgery, ask yourself, well, what else they got to prove this shit? Well, the second thing they give is a document by a guy named Tacitus from the 2nd century. Yeah, we're in the 2nd century now. That's how little evidence they got. No evidence whatsoever from the 1st century. So let's go to the 2nd century. And obviously, since we're in the 2nd century, Tacitus was not born when Jesus was, could have never laid eyes on him, and never even said he laid eyes on him. The only thing Tacitus says is, there's a cult who call themselves Christians that exist in this time period. And nobody doubts at that time there's a cult of Christians. Just like there were all kinds of crazy-ass cults back in the day. Just because there are cults in the day doesn't mean the figures that the cults were worshipping were actually real. And obviously, there were cults back in the day that believed in Thor and Ra and Zeus and all kinds of other horseshit. Just because they believe in that bullshit does not mean those mythical characters actually existed. So that's it, dude. That's pretty much the entirety of the historical evidence to try to prove Jesus actually existed. It's insulting. It's insulting to anybody who is rational, reasonable, and intellectually honest with themselves. It's all we have about Jesus, period, are these fictional stories in the Bible written by anonymous authors. We have no clue who wrote the Bible. No clue at all. Go look it up for yourself. Even historians admit they don't even have the originals. They don't even have copies of the originals. They don't even have copies of copies of copies of the original. As far as Jesus is concerned, they have no historical evidence whatsoever. Now, where does that originate? It originates in the happy example for the Jews of resisting and ultimately expelling the Greeks. The Greeks had run the area before the Romans arrived and under a group of renegade priests there was a rebellion known as the Maccabee Rebellion. The, in the Maccabean Wars the Greeks were expelled and this gave a type, an anticipation of how under the Roman period also, someone could come along, priest come king, come prophet, who would rescue the Jews again. That's where the basis of the messianic prophecies come from. A military leader, a human person, not a, not a God-man, but a human who would lead the Jews to triumph. So their interpretation of Messiah was very much in that traditional Maccabean sense of someone who would be a king and a military leader who would throw out the oppressors. The Christian version of that same story is, of course, very different. It's a collaborationist sort of Messiah. Once I got over the shock of having, you know, being part of our, the most famous man who ever lived didn't. Once you got your head around that, uh, what, I, what I found was that there was this incredible depth of mystical wisdom available for me through the Western tradition, which I hadn't been able to see before. And that, you know, the paradox is, 
that if there's a real, if there is a man underneath it, then he is probably not the man that you think or I think. Because everyone's got a different Jesus, haven't they? You know, it's, Jews have a rabbi Jesus, Hindus think he's an avatar, a lot of people think he's a, a Buddha figure, especially Buddhists. You know, it's like everyone, you know, the Muslims think, they think he's a, a prophet like Muhammad, maybe not quite as good. You know, it's like they, everyone's got their own Jesus. We approach often the, looking for the real Jesus, it seems to me, like we're, just, you know, like we're just taking a chocolate out of a chocolate box. It's like, which one do I fancy? You know, oh, I'll have Jesus the Son of God. Oh, you know, I can't swallow that. Uh, you know, let's have a nutty one. Jesus was a spaceman. You know, I'll have that. That's what we do. But what we need to do is actually look at the evidence. And when you look at the evidence, there really is no Jesus there. We had Philo Judea uh, uh, of Alexandria, Judea, right? living at that time, at that exact time. Here is a Jewish man living in Alexandria, part of the wealthiest family uh, probably on the planet. His books, his writings were significant. They make up a very large book today. They were distributed in his lifetime because of his wealthy family. In that book, those books, he talks about the incarnate word the Logos. This Logos idea had been developed significantly by the Greeks, uh, the living word of God. Philo describes what the word ends up as in the New Testament to a T. The Logos of the living God is the bond of everything, holding all things together, Philo. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1.17 It's like they lifted it and put it into the New Testament. And yet, while he was writing this, in his homeland, his word supposedly took incarnation right there at that time. And he had no idea, no mention of it. <laughs> No concept, no interest, didn't even say, hey, I hear that my word has taken birth in my homeland. Doesn't even say that. Doesn't say a thing. You have to wonder, why? Uh, is it because it didn't happen? Is it because they used Philo's writings to create this fictional character? There's, if you read Philo's writings, which were published uh, in the mid-twenties, before Jesus was uh, uh, in his, doing his ministry, never been heard of, he's still doing his carpentry work, according to Christian tradition. Uh, these, Philo's writings have so many Christian ideas in them that, you know, you really have to wonder. If you had that kind of pipeline and your works are that well known, and yet then, and then sometime later, these same ideas end up in, I mean, almost verbatim, some of them, end up in, in the gospel story. It seems to be pretty obvious when you factor in all of the, uh, the factors that you need to understand the uh, context and milieu of the day. The only way you can sustain this story, really, is to have it in a vacuum, is to remove all practicality around it, all the other cultures. And seriously, you would, not, you would have to be absolutely ignorant of all history, mythology, culture, uh, language of the time in order to maintain that story. Unfortunately, that's what we find. <laughs> There is quite a lot of ignorance and willful ignorance. I've actually had debates with people who have said, oh, I don't want to know anything about those pre-Christian cultures because they were all evil. I can't give you any evidence then at that point. You've completely closed off. There's no way I can prove a thing if you have no interest in looking at the pre-Christian culture. So yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to catch 22 with this one. Um, and yeah, it becomes a matter of faith. They have no problem. There is that special pleading again. We can believe this without a stitch of evidence because it's faith. But 
we can't believe anything that you've said without a mountain of evidence that we will still reject <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> History began to be manipulated from the true origins of mankind when the rise of Christianity emerged. The Christian churches began to promote the worship of the Father and Son and suppress the other religions of Mother Nature. The favor of the masculine was very evident in the Bible, and the Brotherhood was aware of that. The Bible shows a suppression of the feminine by following mainly male figures, priests are only male, God is described as a he, and God is the male identity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This religion is so devoted to the worship of the Son that there is barely any spot for the worship of the moon energy. Most religions of the world display prominent male figures, and the cause of this is to offset the balance and suppress the feminine moon aspect. Christianity began as the worship of many different things, but the worship of a divine human was not one of them. In his book, Tales from the Time Loop, David Icke once wrote, Official history has been changed to hide the fact that the world has been controlled by the same interbreeding tribe for thousands of years. This is never more so than with the major religions. They all have inner and outer levels of knowledge. The inner level carries the secrets going back to the ancient mystery schools of places like Sumer, Babylon, and Egypt. These include the secrets of the bloodline. The only chosen few are initiated into this awareness. The outer level is where the secrets are hidden in code and allegory and sold with a deity to the masses as the truth. The New Testament gospel stories are based on the initiation ceremonies and the esoteric secrets, including astrology and sun worship that were performed and communicated in the mystery schools. But they are presented as a literal story to fool the people. The religions, not least Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, all spawn from the same source and are carriers of the secrets inner and controllers of the people by hiding the secrets with the allegedly literal stories outer. The same basic Jesus tale of the Son of God who died for humanity was told around the world for thousands of years before Christianity. There are about 15 pre-Christian gods that shared the same story as Jesus Christ. For instance, the god Krishna around 900 BC was born from a virgin and had a star in the east which signaled his arrival. An evil tyrant then murdered thousands of babies in hopes of killing Krishna. He was described as a great teacher and healer and performed miracles. Krishna was then crucified between two thieves and then rose from the dead three days later, as the legend state. The name Krishna is also spelt Krishna, which is similar to Christ. The Greek god Attis lived around the same time and was also born on December 25th of the virgin Nana. He was called the Good Shepherd and was the only begotten son. His cult would have a meal in which it was considered that his body was the bread and his priests were described as eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, just as Matthew 19, 12 states. He was a divine father and son. Addis was detailed as being crucified on a tree in which his holy blood redeemed earth and again was dead for three days until his resurrection. Addis was even described as the most high God and his story is just one of many that is identical with Jesus Christ. He was thought of as the truth and light, and similarly, Addis was worshipped on the day of the sun, Sunday, just like Christianity, which would come hundreds of years later at the Council of Nicaea. In David Icke's book, The Biggest Secret, he wrote, Everything Christians believe about Jesus, the Romans and Persians believed about Mithra. Sunday was a sacred day for Mithraist, because he was the sun god, and they called this the Lord's Day. The writer H.G. Wells pointed out that many of the phrases used by Paul for Jesus were the same as those used by the followers of Mithra. The liturgy of Mithra is the liturgy of Jesus. When Paul says, they drink from the spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10.4, he was using exactly the same words found in the scriptures of Mithra, only the names were changed. In the Gospels, Peter became the Christian rock on whom the new church would be built. The Vatican Hill in Rome was said to be sacred to Peter, but this place was also claimed much earlier to be sacred to Mithra, and many Mithric remains have been found there. Helen Ellerbys, The Dark Side of Christian History, states, 
Christianity resembled certain elements of Roman belief, particularly the worship of Mithra or Mithraism. As protector of the empire, Mithra was closely tied to the sun gods, Helios and Apollo. Mithra's birthday on December 25th, close to the winter solstice, became Jesus' birthday. Shepherds were to have witnessed Mithra's birth and were to have partaken in the Last Supper with Mithra before he returned to heaven. Mithra's ascension, correlating to the sun's return to prominence around the spring equinox, became this Christian holiday of Easter. Christians took over a cave temple dedicated to Mithra in Rome on the Vatican Hill, making it the seat of the Catholic Church. The Mithraic high priest title, Pater Patrum, soon became the title for the Bishop of Rome, Papa or Pope. The Fathers of Christianity explain the remarkable similarities of Mithraism as the work of the devil, declaring the much older legends of Mithraism to be the insidious imitation of the one true faith. Matrix of Power by Jordan Maxwell states the following, Were you aware of the 15 major religions that had the same identical teachings of Christianity? Most people aren't, and I am very suspect of the 16th religion, which is copied off of the 15 previous religions, and I am told that this one is the truth. There were many deities before Christ that were born of a virgin on December 25th, died and resurrected. Krishna of Hindustan, Salavahana of Bermuda, Buddha Sakya of India, Zeulus and Osiris of Egypt, Odin of the Scandinavians, Zoroaster and Mithra of Persia, Krite of Chaldea, Baal and Tot of Phoenicia, Indra of Tibet, Bali of Afghanistan, Jao of Nepal, Witoba of the Bailonganese, Tammuz of Syria, Attias of Phrygia, Eskimoskis of Thrace, Zor of the Bonzes, Adad of Assyria, Devatat and Samanakadam of Siam, Alcides of Thebes, Mikado of the Sintus, Bedru of Japan, Hesus, Eros, and Burmila of the Druids, Thor of the Gauls, Cadmus of Greece, Hill and Feta of the Mandates, Gentat and Quixcalcot of Mexico, Universal Monarch of the Siblis, Iski of the Island of Formosa, Divine Teacher of Plato, Holy One of Zaka, Fohi and Tien of China, Adonis of Greece, Prometheus of Caucasus, and Ixion and Quirius of Rome. For more info, go to www.ericdubay.com. Okay, a little quiz. Who am I talking about? He was born to a virgin by immaculate conception through the intervention of a Holy Spirit. This fulfilled an ancient prophecy. When he was born, the ruling tyrant wanted to kill him. His parents had to flee to safety. All male children under the age of two were slain by the ruler as he sought to kill the child. Angels and shepherds were at his birth, and he was given gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He was worshipped as the savior of men and led a moral and humble life. He performed miracles which included healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, casting out devils, and raising the dead. He was put to death on a cross between two thieves. He descended to hell and rose from the dead to ascend back to heaven. Sounds exactly like Jesus, doesn't it? But it's not. That is how they described the Eastern Savior, God known as Varishna, 1200 years before Jesus' claim to have been born. The Biggest Secret by David Icke why do so many different religions across the world repeatedly share the same stories, symbols, numbers, and dates? This is related to the winter solstice, or midwinter festival, when the sun is at the least powerful point in its cycle, in the northern hemisphere. They said that on the solstice, our December 21st, 22nd, the sun had died. Three days later, on the 25th, they said the sun was born or born again. Thus we have a long line of sun gods given the birthday of December 25th. The Jesus of the Gospels is a symbol of the sun, and the stories include the host of the other mystery school knowledge and esoteric concepts. Tales from the Time Loop by David Icke Many ancient deities were born on December 25th, which originated from the sun cults. Jordan Maxwell once wrote, For three days, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, the sun rises on the exact same latitudinal declinations degree. This is the only time in the year that
that the sun actually stops its movement northward or southward in our sky. On the morning of December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward, beginning its annual journey back to us in the northern hemisphere, ultimately bringing our spring. Anything steadily moving all year long that suddenly stops moving for three days was considered to have died. Therefore, God's son, who was dead for three days, moves one degree northward on December 25th and is symbolically born again. Sirius is a star in the east and is the brightest star in the night sky. Since ancient times, Orion's belt has had three brightest stars, known as the Three Kings. On December 24th, Sirius aligns perfectly with the Three Kings, pointing directly to the spot where the sun will rise on December 25th. This all takes place in the constellation that the ancients knew of as the Manger, which could clearly be seen. Therefore, the Three Kings of the Night Sky, or Three Magi, follow the Star of the East, Sirius, to the Manger, where the Son of God is born at the winter solstice on December 25th. All the deities of religions and sun cults were born on December 25th on the winter solstice because this is the birth of the sun, hence the birth of a sun god. This is why Jesus Christ and many other deities are born on December 25th and God's son. Even Easter originates from Sirius, the star of the east. Frankincense, myrrh, and gold are the three gifts of the Magi and these two are a part of the sun cult religions. Frankincense was described as an amber resin that was burned at solar temples. Myrrh was known to the ancients as the tears of the sun, and gold was always represented as the sun. The virgin birth is a reoccurring theme for the ancient sun gods of the world. The virgin represents Virgo, the constellation which is Latin for virgin. In the ancient world, the glyph for Virgo created the appearance of an M, this would provide a logical explanation for why the names for many of the Virgin Mothers began with M's, such as Mary the mother of Jesus, Maya the mother of Buddha, Miria the mother of Adonis, and Isis Mary the mother of Horus. Virgo was known as the House of Bread, and the symbol of the zodiac displays a woman which holds a chaff of wheat. This represents the harvest of August and September. Just like Virgo, Bethlehem also means House of Bread but it is not a place on earth, but actually a reference to the constellation of Virgo. The Southern Cross, also known as Crux, is a cross formed in the night sky which symbolizes the crucifixion, and this is where the sun remains on December 22nd, which is also the lowest point in the sky. The sun moves downward until December 22nd. It stops all movement for the three days on the Southern Cross, then it rises on December 25th. Thus, the Son of God dies on the cross, and three days later is resurrected. Nobody in the ancient world thought the sun was God, but they used it to show the true glory of God. The darkness of night was considered to be the greatest enemy of mankind in the ancient world. With the darkness being the dangerous enemy, the sun was what gave the world light and the greatest gift from God. The sun is the light of the world, just as Jesus, the sun provides light, warmth, and energy, and without these things, we could not see, move, or even grow food. Humanity depends on the sun's energy to survive. Therefore, the sun is what gives us life, and was thought of as our savior. Deuteronomy 4.24 and Hebrews 12.29 speak of God as a consuming fire of heaven. Take this and apply it to John 3.16. God so loves the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, S-U-N, that we may have everlasting life. The prince of darkness, known as the devil, the D, evil, is the dark evil, and God is the good. The son of God is the light of the world, and the prince of peace. The son's peace is solace, which derived from solar, meaning sun. The Egyptians had their own personification. Set was the prince of darkness, who ruled over the night, and Horus was the sun. At sun set, every night the dark evil the prince of darkness takes over the world, but when morning comes, the sun is born again at sun rise, when Horus is risen upon the horizon. Eric Dubé stated, this is where we get the word hero, the cheer hooray, and also why an interpretation of the zodiac is a horoscope. Golgotha means place of the skull, and is at our temples, and this is where the son of God is crucified between two thieves, which represent the past and future. The sun's plasma atmosphere is known as the corona, which is Latin for crown, 
and is allegorical for the infamous crown of thorns. Jesus is shown on a crucifix with a crown of thorns, just like the sun is shown with its crown of thorns, the corona. Ancient cultures use the sun to keep track of time and seasons. Circular sundials and calendars time daily and yearly, and the months were recorded using lunar calendars. Ancient civilizations used solar calendar methods such as the Mayans, Incas, Aztecs, Babylonians, Sumerians, Egyptians, Assyrians, Aryans, and Celtics. The Holy Cross would eventually be developed from the circular sun calendars. The sun is displayed on a cross with perpendicular lines crossing together representing seasons. The horizontal line represents the spring and autumn equinoxes, while the vertical line represents the summer and winter solstices. This explains why many Christian and Celtic crosses have circles around them. The book of Matthew, or the name Mat, in fact is Mayat, which was the ancient Egyptian goddess. Mayat is depicted as holding the scales of justice while blindfolded. The scales of justice are astronomically in relation to Libra, which was the last sign to be added to the zodiac. This is parallel to why Matthew, Matt, was the last of the twelve disciples to join. Matt in Christian iconography is shown and symbolized as an eagle, and this is because the closest constellation to Libra is Aquila the eagle. Matthew was the disciple that the other twelve did not want to accept because he was a tax collector which is always symbolized with scales and balances. Tax collectors would have their scales and balances carried around with them because they took grain and livestock and not just currency. The book of Mark is depicted as Mars. Mars is the ruler of Aries, so the book of Mark would actually be the book of Aries. Aries is the root word for arise, and is the first zodiac where the sun would arise at the time of the spring equinox, or Easter. April derived from the Latin word aperio, which would mean to open or begin. April is the month of Aries, and in many cultures is the first month of the year, just as Aries was the first zodiacal sign. The ancients believed that the spring equinox was the correct time to start the yearly calendar because the hours of the day would pass the hours of the night. The sun's light would defeat the darkness as it is resurrected and Mother Nature would begin to bloom. The Book of Luke would then be the Book of Leo. The name Luke is Latin for Lucius, which means light. Leo the Lion is the House of Light. Lions are demonstrated to symbolize the sun and its rays, showing the lion's yellow face and mane. Christ, which is another symbol for the sun, is known to be the Lion of Judea. The Book of John is the fourth gospel and is the Book of Aquarius. The month for John would be January, which is the month that goes with Aquarius. The symbol given to Aquarius is a man carrying and pouring a pitcher of water, which would be the reason for John the Baptist in baptism. Michael Sarian writes, John comes from Jahan, er, John, which comes from the earlier, Yenes, Owanes, the fish god. Jahan or John gives us other names like Jane, Joan, Janus, or even Jesus, or Jesus. It eventually gives us the word January or January. During January, Aquarius, the Nile waters were the purest, so the Egyptians would collect it for use in Talistic rites. The sign of Aquarius became associated with baptism, cleansing, and purification by water. This was borrowed by the Israelites and finds its way into the Christian traditions. So now we see the Gospels clearly detailed as signs of the Zodiac. The Sun King must pass through these signs. They are his chroniclers, chron meaning time specifically relating to the round of the Zodiac. They are his measurers, his apostles, post means demarcation post, a color of the Zodiac. They are his disciples, disc meaning round circle as is the zodiac. John the Baptist was beheaded, and this is also an astrological allegory. On August 29th, John's or Aquarius's head or star moves right above the horizon. The rest of his body or constellation sits just below the horizon. While this is happening at dusk, the sun proceeds to set in Leo, which is a kingly sign representing Herod. This is Herod beheading John. Thomas Paine once said, The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man whom they call Christ in the place of the sun, and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the sun. In the Atlantean conspiracy, 
Eric Debay states, Why do the chronological events describing the supposed life of Jesus Christ in the New Testament run perfectly parallel to the ancient allegorical understanding of the sun's journey through the houses of the zodiac? John 14.2 says that in the Father's house there are many rooms or many mansions, twelve to be more precise, the twelve houses or rooms of the zodiac. There are also 72 extra zodiacal constellations known as the Parentelians. This is why Jesus is said to have officially had 12 servants with 72 others that also carried the message. The 72 angels on Jacob's ladder in the 72 nations in Genesis also relate to these 72 deacons, one for every five degrees of the zodiac. It serendipitously takes 72 years to move one degree through the zodiacal precision of the equinoxes. Hence, Confucius, 6th century BC to China, had 72 initiated disciples and set. Ancient Egypt had 72 accomplices in the death of Osiris. Luke 22.10 says, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This passage represents Aquarius, the man holding the pitcher of water at the end of the age of Pisces. Pisces is the current age, and is symbolized by two fish, which would explain why Jesus finds two fishermen at the beginning of his ministry. The Christian mythos coincided with the age of Pisces. This is the reason why there is much in the way of water symbolism in the New Testament. Michael Tsarian In Matthew 4.19, Jesus says to Peter, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus later feeds them with fish in Matthew 14.17 and says, We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Virgo is the house of bread, and the fifth zodiac, which gives us five loaves of Virgo, or bread, and the two Piscean fish. In many old Christian churches, along with the artwork, the Piscean dual fish symbol can be seen. This is why many reborn Christians have the Jesus fish symbol. None is also the Hebrew word for fish. Take a look at the Pope's headdress. When placed horizontally, it looks like a giant fish head. Christian words derived from astrological meanings, such as apostles and disciples. The word pastor was originally pa store. Pa meant great or father, and store derived from aster, which meant star. Therefore, pastor means great star or father star, which would be the sun, giving us our sun god. Even the words minister and ministry originate from min and aster. Min was an ancient term for moon, while aster, along with stir and store, were all related to star. Minister would mean moon star. Monastery, monk, month, and minute all have the same origin, which go back to the lunar cults. Our watches have three hands, which relate to the three planets with time. Min was for minute hand, and the fast hand is Mercury, which rotates the fastest. This explains why the god Mercury has wings on his feet. Church originated from the Greek goddess of deception, Circe, who in mythology lured men into her lair and then would transform them into pigs. Amen is a word used at the end of every prayer by Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and Jews. Amen came from the pharaoh Amenhotep and Amun-Ra, the Egyptian god. Amen was known as the Hidden One. He could change into many other gods like Osiris and Set. It is through these solar, lunar, and stellar cults that Amun-Ra is prayed to by billions of people. According to Jordan Maxwell, when you end a prayer, you are saying, Let it be hidden, let it be unseen. Amen has a consort named Ament, giving us the Old and New Test Ament. A symbolic representative of Amun-Ra is the obelisk, and it can be found at the Vatican, Washington, D.C., and even London. Vatican derived from Vaticinia, meaning place of divinations, or even place of sorcerers. As Eric Dubé states in the Atlantean Conspiracy, the Vatican actually funds and controls every astronomical telescope and observatory in the world, and all findings run through the Vatican before both the public and scientific communities. Mass derives from the Egyptian mess, an annual sacred cake ritually baked with Nile riverbank clay. Yule shares roots with the word wheel, and a Yule log at winter solstice represents the full turn of the zodiacal wheel. The Roman title, name Julius, derived from Yule, 
which explains why Julius Caesar was crowned under the god Jupiter at the winter solstice. The word arc in archbishop and archdeacon refers to the sun's arc across the sky. Bishop literally means one who knows the sky, and deacon comes from deacon, the three 10 degree sections divided into each of the 12 signs of the zodiac. The largest Christian evangelical network is Daystar Corporation. The astrological symbolism is easily seen and understood by those initiated. Revelation 22.16 says, I am the root and offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Even Christ identified himself as the morning star, which is the sun, the star of the morning, just as Horus. Of course, Revelation ends with Amen giving homage to Amun-Ra, the Egyptian god. Jesus Christ is clearly connected to the sun, and Christianity is nothing more than a sun cult. But was Jesus even a real person? Christianity did not begin as what the priesthood would have us believe it was. It was originally an amalgamation or combination of beliefs of the ancients, and began as Gnosticism. Gnosticism throughout history has been the religious belief of understanding God through the Gnosis, or divine knowledge. Gnostics sought the understanding of existence through their perception of symbology in religious literature. Gnostics seek to know the true secrets of God through a religion they accept. Gnosticism looks for answers within oneself and seeks inner enlightenment for a greater understanding. Gnostics claimed that they were the original Christians and that they were anti-materialist and prescribed to the belief of Christ's consciousness and believed that the kingdom of heaven was within. They focused on attaining the Gnosis in spiritual science, and when accused of blasphemy by the Orthodoxy, the Gnostics refuted the claims and said the Orthodoxy were the true blasphemers. The Gnostics claimed the Orthodoxy read the Bible too literally and did not understand who Christ was. The Orthodoxy claimed that Christ was a historical person who was incarnated into human flesh, had twelve disciples, healed, was crucified, and then resurrected three days later. The Gnostics claimed that Christ could never take human form, therefore everything is symbolic. Christianity is a proven sun cult which ties its origins back to the Gnostics until the Orthodoxy took over. Constantine outlawed Gnosticism in 325 AD, and the Brotherhood has held its secrets of its true origins hidden. There are three G's in Freemasonry, God, Geometry, and Gnosticism. This is why within the compass square there is a symbolic G. Christianity originally began as Gnosticism, redone with lies to portray Jesus as a historical person and to take the Bible literally. It wasn't until Orthodox Christianity came around that people began to believe Jesus was a real person. Saint Athanasius, a bishop of Alexandria, wrote, Should we understand sacred writ according to letter? Should we fall into the most enormous blasphemies? This means it is a big sin to read the Bible literally. Similar to the story of the Tower of Babel in Fiji, there is a place they claim the ancient Fijians tried to build a tall tower to the moon with the purpose to see if it was inhabited. Stories like this are found everywhere worldwide, including India. The Hindus speak of Saktideva, who was swallowed by a big fish and left it unhurt. Hercules was also swallowed by a big fish, or whale, and he was in it for three days until exiting. These stories are completely parallel to Jonah and the whale. Even Sumerian tablets record a place called Eden, which is the abode of the righteous ones. Just as the Garden of Eden in Genesis, the story of Moses is similar to King Sargon of Sumeria, who is set in a basket by his mother floating down the river. Moses is similar to Mysis of Syria, Minos of Crete, and Manau of India. There is no historical evidence for the existence of a man called Moses except in the text produced by the Levites and other writings and opinions stimulated by those texts. The official background to Moses and his name have no historical basis. Nothing was known about the Moses story or the plagues inflicted upon the Egyptians until the Levites of Babylon wrote Exodus centuries after it was supposed to have happened. The word Moses means, he who has been taken away, he who has been put out from the waters. He who has been made a missionary, an ambassador, an apostle. The chief priest in the Egyptian temples was called Yove or Yova, hence the emergence of the name Jehovah. And the Hebrew language is really the sacred language of the Egyptian mystery schools. 
The Biggest Secret by David Icke. At the time of Jesus, there were dozens of historians, and yet absolutely zero of them record anything about Jesus, his family, or followers. Aelus Perseus, Columella, Justus of Tiberius, Livy, Lucaris, Lucius Florus, Petronius, Phaedrus, Philo Judaeus, Phlegon, Plutarch, Pomponius Mela, Rufus Curtius, Quintilian, Quintus Curtius, Seneca, Silas Italicus, Theon of Cymerna, Valerius Flaccus, Valerius Maximus. Wouldn't somebody as special of Jesus have been recorded by at least one of these historians? No, none of them speak of Jesus or his death. They don't even record how an innocent man was crucified by Pilate because the popular Pharisees hated him. Jesus performed miracles, including feeding 5,000 people, and was loved by thousands and hated by thousands more, yet none of the historians even bothered to write down anything that might possibly describe Jesus. This same man was crucified publicly and resurrected three days later, where supposedly, as the church states, hundreds saw Christ's ascension, yet no historians at the time even thought of recording it. The Bible even states that the sky went pitch black for three hours and an earthquake occurred at the death of this man named Jesus, yet no historians cared to write it down. Even a solar eclipse could not explain this because the longest duration of a solar eclipse is seven minutes. Wouldn't a man as special as Jesus be mentioned at least once outside of the Bible? The Bible is the only historical evidence of Jesus, and that's when taken literally. In conclusion with the evidence, the most logical assumption to be made is that Jesus Christ never existed. Many atheists deny Christ as being God, but even they never doubted his existence, so this is one of the greatest lies of our time. There is no historical evidence of Jesus Christ's existence. Flavius Josephus is one proof the church has used, but Josephus wasn't even born at the time of Jesus, so he could not have even witnessed anything. Also, Josephus' small writing on Jesus was proven as a forgery for hundreds of years. Three historians such as Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, and Ceutonius wrote about the Christ and more specifically, Christus, which means anointed one, and this can refer to anyone with the claim. Krishna was known as the Christus, and many more, and yet there is still no historical account for Jesus. Even the slightest evidence to show the existence of the apostles, who supposedly wrote the Gospels, do not have any historical evidence of even existing. Christianity is another religion with no historical evidence and is centered around the sun. You know, it's really a shame that people are not allowed to sit down and, and talk about things, you know. When the churches and all the religious people would just say, hey, you know, let's be fair and let's talk about where all this stuff came from that we think is, you know, Christianity or whatever. But what's really sad about it is there is a truth that is kept from people. And people think, well, our religion is the true religion, not realizing that our religion is stolen and copied word from word from numerous old religious myths and cults. I mean, it's true. People can get mad at you for that, say, hey, you shouldn't say that. But it's true. But you're, you know, you're, you're kind of damned almost as some kind of a traitor or a cultist or a Satanist if you dare say such a thing. But Christianity is a religious concept that comes uh, from the ideas of many ancient beliefs. Buddhists, Jews, Hindus, Chaldeans, Egyptians, Persians, they took something from everybody. The nativity, like we talked about, the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ is copied word for word from the birth of Hare Krishna. Devaki was a, a virgin. She found that she was pregnant. An angel came and told her she was going to give birth to Hare Krishna, who was God. The wicked king, whose name was Kansa, heard that Hare Krishna was going to try to overthrow his kingdom. So 
he turns around and kills all the children two years and younger. Uh, she gives birth in a, in a cave. The, the stars were very auspicious. And uh, the, the cowherd girls, the shepherds of the time, were the first ones to come and see him. I mean, what, it's copied. So the birth of Jesus is copied word for word from that. And it has to be that way because that was thousands of years before Jesus. So why did they copy it? And then, of course, he's born on December the 25th which is the day that the sun has been born in, since the beginning of time because of the winter solstice. It's the end of the winter solstice and the sun is born on December the 25th. You can, you can, you can start, if you want to track basically the origin of Christianity, you can start in ancient Egypt where science really flourished, but there was a, a great uh, contrast between the people who had money the people that didn't have any money. And the people that had the money were the priests and the politicians. <laughs> hey, I mean, you, you heard about this guy, Tilton. I, I guess they finally got him off the air. But this guy's making, you know, he was an evangelist on television. He was making more than Madonna and, and, and Michael Jackson put together. But these guys lived in luxury. And, and, and you know, what you see with these, you know, evangelists, I'm not talking about pastors of local churches now. They're, I'm not talking about that. Pastors of local churches are, are fine people. They're doing the best they can. I'm talking about these show business people on TV that do this stuff. But the Egyptians started this whole thing, and really it, it turned into what we call Christianity because they had a longing for a blessed immortality beyond the grave. That's what they were looking for. So they invented this afterlife, you know, and uh, and the entrance into this afterlife was based on, on how well a, per, a, a person practiced their religion. Not how good they were, but how well they practiced their religion. In other words, in Christianity, it's not basically whether you're good. They say it has nothing to do with anything. It's whether you say these magic words, you know. See, if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, well, they don't do it. Because receiving Jesus Christ as Lord specifically means you must do what he says. And what he taught was the single eye meditation as the first thing a person must do and that's the one thing that Christians say is evil so how can they be saved anyhow but long before there was Jesus Christ long before there was Christianity people tried to find salvation in what was called the kingdom of Osiris O-S-I-R-I-S -I -I before Osiris was Tem or Ra R-A the father of all. And, 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 and Ra came out of, a, of an egg. He, he laid an egg in the chaotic waters of the earth, and then he himself was born from that egg. It's the same thing where you know, Mary is both the husband uh, and the mother of God. And that egg, the, the, the birth of the Savior from the egg, is, is part and parcel of the, of the Easter myth. Of course, <laughs> that's one of the strange things in Christianity where they, they call their holiest day Easter because it, it comes from the um, Astarte or Ishtar of Babylon, which is the goddess of fertility, the goddess of actual sex. The goddess of sexual intercourse was Easter. And uh, what they would do... Uh, the myth was that Tammuz, who was Easter's husband, and she, uh, he would die, and then every spring he would come out of a gray-colored egg, and uh, they would have great celebrations. But they had a 40-day period before he rose from the egg in which they all put stuff, the ashes, and they mourned and so forth. And then they would go out, and they would face the east at the point of the rising sun, and they would have these great services. And then uh, on, on this day, of fulfillment, uh, they would all go to the temple, and the women of the temple had to uh, have sexual intercourse with the first guy that came to church. This is true, I'm telling you. This is in ba you know, Babylon. And because uh, I always say to people, Jesus, all they had to do was wear their Easter bonnet. They didn't have to, they'd have to wear anything else. But uh, this is the day, and they, had, and they had bunnies, and they had chicks, and all of the stuff. This is the day that Christianity accepts as its holy day. So, I mean, that, that in of itself should say something's wrong here. You know? Anyhow, but when God came from the egg, he became Ra. Amen, Ra. Amen, Ra. That's interesting. Did you, you know his first name was Amen? That's why you say Amen when you end your prayers. Because it's, you're saying, well, so be it. It doesn't mean that. Amen is the name of the Egyptian sun god, and it's an homage to the god Amen. Uh, and in the great temples of Egypt, they would always... A chant out, Amen, Amen, Amen. And in fact, in Jesus calls himself the Amen 
in Revelation 3 something, 316 I believe it is, in which he then identifies himself as the Egyptian sun god. And you're going to say, oh, hey, come on now, you've gone too far. Jesus wasn't the Egyptian sun god. Matthew 2 says Mary and Joseph took the child Jesus to Egypt to fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt. Have I called my son? Hmm. From Sunday sermons to our most recent Hollywood spectacles, the scenes are as familiar as nearly 2,000 years of repetition can make them. But very few in our modern world are aware that there is no historical proof that Jesus ever existed. Is the Bible really infallible, as Christians claim? The lack of evidence for Jesus begins with the many historical mistakes contained in the New Testament. Nobody knows when Jesus was born, which is very odd. The Bible story claims everyone, including King Herod the Great and three wise men, knew the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. King Herod even directs the three wise men to follow the star. In the Gospel of Luke, after Jesus is born, he is taken to the temple and declared to be the Messiah, so Herod would have known about him right away. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Herod doesn't find out about Jesus until about two years later. The Gospel of Matthew states Jesus was born before King Herod's death, which occurred in 4 BC. Matthew also says that the family fled to Egypt to escape the Herod kings. But the Gospel of Luke states that Jesus was born during a census dated by historians to 6 AD, 10 years after Herod's death. Luke does not mention an escape to Egypt and says the family stayed in Nazareth the whole time. Matthew then says that King Herod killed off all the male infants in an entire town, hoping to murder the baby Jesus. This became known as the slaughter of the innocents. In his book, Antiquities of the Jews, the first century Jewish Roman historian Josephus lists all the crimes of King Herod. If Herod had murdered the children of an entire area to kill one infant, Josephus would have included it. Josephus doesn't mention it because it never happened. King Herod killing the infants occurs only in the Gospel of Matthew. No other Gospel mentions it. Historians of the time do not mention it. In the book, The Bible on Earth, published in 2001, the director of Tel Aviv University's excavations in Israel shows how archaeological evidence disproves the existence of Abraham and other Hebrew patriarchs. Abraham and Moses never existed. Jerusalem was only a small village in the time of King David and King Solomon. The existences of David and Solomon are also questioned. Jews and Christians call themselves the children of Abraham. When the prophet Muhammad created Islam, he declared that Arabs are also the children of Abraham. The last victory of monotheism in the Middle East occurred in 610 AD, when Muhammad combined the pagan god Allah with the Judeo-Christian god Jehovah. Muhammad was an Old Testament prophet from Medina, which at the time was a Jewish settlement and had been for centuries. Muhammad used the story of Abraham's maid to claim Arabs were also the children of Abraham. But even Israeli archaeologists now agree that the story of Abraham is just a story. This means that the original Hebrew religion was created by men, not handed down by God to any chosen people. Jesus, even if he did exist, could not be the only begotten son of this manufactured God. The conflicts among Jews, Christians, and Islamists continue to this day, but it is undeniable that all three religions rose from the same monotheistic source. 
Luke and Matthew say Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But John says Jesus was born in Galilee. And the Jews rejected Jesus because he was not from Bethlehem, from where the Messiah had to come. There are many historical inaccuracies in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments. The Bible says the high priests Caiaphas and Annas judged Jesus. But in reality, Annas was removed from the office of high priest in 15 AD. Caiaphas became high priest in 18 AD. Annas and Caiaphas never were joint priests. There never were two joint high priests. The Gospels portray rebellious acts of Jesus, such as evicting the money changers from the temple. But Josephus does not mention them. The Roman historian Tacitus states there was no disturbance in Palestine during the period when Jesus is supposed to have lived. Some of the worst mistakes concern Pontius Pilate. In Luke, Pilate sheds the blood of the Galileans and adds it to their sacrifices. This act was committed by another governor many years before Pilate's rule. After the trial of Jesus, Pilate invokes the so-called Passover practice of freeing a prisoner when he asks the Jews to choose between Jesus and Barabbas. No such Passover practice ever existed. As Jesus is whipped through the streets, the Jews are made to shout, May his blood be upon us, which are exactly the words shouted during the sacrifices of previous Savior gods before Jesus. If the historical Jesus spoke alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was there to record his words? No one. The speech is meant for an audience, not the ears of God. It is physically impossible for all the events of the Passion to have occurred in the time allotted. Luke even throws in an extra visit to the king. The Jewish tribunal would not sit during the night of Passover feast, and the Jewish Sabbath is repeatedly violated. Crucifying Jesus at Passover would have broken at least seven of their religious laws. Historically, the Roman period was one of the best documented ever, but Jesus is not mentioned in history, outside of known forgeries and poorly researched fictions. The evidence instead is that the Catholic Church later went back and destroyed as much of the history of the early Christian period as it possibly could, including over a hundred volumes of the Roman historian Livy. These are the actions of someone with something to hide. The Persian and Roman sun god Mithra in the Mithraic Kronos, or personification of infinite time, is in the center of the zodiac. He is surrounded by his twelve helpers, or the twelve helpers of the sun. You will often find a goddess, a sun, or some sort of divine entity inside the zodiac when depicted in art. There are even old paintings and murals of Christ sitting on a throne surrounded by his twelve helpers. Sometimes these are depicted as twelve angels, and other times the twelve disciples. We've even found some that are depicted as the twelve signs of the zodiac. The important thing to know about the deity is that the deity is merely a character. It is the character's characteristics and the physical posture that are important. The name of the character can be interchanged and applied to different cultures and ages, but the numerous characteristics have remained the same in various deities, including Christ, Krishna, Horus, Mithra, Buddha, Quetzalcoatl, and many others. Why do the four Gospels conflict on the most basic matters of Jesus' life? Because originally they represented competing schools of Christian thought. They were eventually brought together in the New Testament because some of these schools agreed that Jesus should be someone who actually lived. Up to 30 other Gospels were left out of the New Testament because their stories of Jesus are clearly fictional. The Gospels that were left out of the New Testament are now called the Gnostic Gospels. Justin Martyr was one of the leading early Christian writers who wanted to make Jesus a historical figure. Justin's writings are available in the original Greek without later changes made by the Catholic Church. In these original writings, Justin directly quotes the Old Testament over 300 times, often directly naming Old Testament authors, but he never, not even once, quotes Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Justin Martyr, who never quotes from the New Testament Gospels, does refer to these Gnostic Gospels. In his writings, Justin continually argues with the Gnostics about whether Jesus really existed. 
From his writings and others, historians can reconstruct the arguments of the Gnostic Christians who knew that Jesus was not originally a historic figure. Justin's original writings are proof that the four Gospels did not exist before his death in 165 AD. So for the Gnostics, they are carrying the real tradition. The literalists are an imitation church. They, they, they see it. At one, one lovely line I love is a church full of bishops. It's like it's, an, it's about authority. It's about people setting themselves up. It's it not dissimilar to today. It's never, you know, it's always the same, isn't it? There's individuals who come into spirituality because they want to awaken themselves and each other to a state of oneness and love. And there's other people who are interested in setting themselves up with a bunch of followers, making a good living, having a little cult. And the Gnostics saw the literalist church, the one that would become the Roman, uh, the, uh, Roman Catholic Church, as that. As an authoritarian structure designed to, to fleece people. Only the most ignorant of Christians today still believes that the Gospels were written by the Apostles. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia admits the Apostles did not write them. Historians document and Christian scholars admit that the Apostles did not write the New Testament. And if Jesus did not exist, the Apostles did not exist. The historical proofs most often given for the existence of Jesus are that he is mentioned by Josephus and that since there are Christians there must have been a Jesus. But hundreds of religions have worshipped someone who did not really exist. Josephus wrote extensively about other radical Jewish sects such as the Essenes. Wouldn't Josephus have written extensively about Jesus? As late as 94 AD, Josephus had nothing to say except one short paragraph that even Catholic bishops have called a rank and stupid forgery. In the forgery, Josephus is made to say Jesus was Christ, but Josephus was never a Christian. Only a Christian would make that statement. In other writings, Josephus says the Emperor Vespasian is the Messiah. Josephus lived in Rome during the time of St. Paul, the convert St. Paul was supposedly the leading Christian figure in Rome and so dangerous that he was publicly executed under the Emperor Nero. But Josephus doesn't mention Paul either, nor is Paul mentioned by other historians of the day. The epistles of Paul are some of the earliest Christian writings. But first we have to deal with more forgeries, this time of Paul. The general consensus among modern scholars is that just seven of Paul's epistles are genuine. Separate these from the rest of the New Testament and it becomes clear that Paul only describes the story from the crucifixion onward. And he does not know about the Gospels. He never refers to Jesus of Nazareth or Bethlehem. He does not refer to Judas, Pilate, and the other biblical characters and does not quote any of the sayings or sermons of Jesus. Many scholars note that these are actually Gnostic in flavor, like the Gnostic Gospels that were not included in the New Testament. Marcion of Pontus, a Gnostic Christian who opposed the attempt to change Jesus into a historical character, called Paul the greatest disciple of Christ. Marcion claimed to have found the epistles of Paul in Antioch and was the first to publish them in Rome. But the Paul Marcion may be referring to as the pre-Christian teacher and philosopher Apollonius of Tyana, a well-known historical figure who lived to about 100 AD. Paul was said to be born in Tarsus. Apollonius was schooled in Tarsus. Paul was said to have fought the wild beasts at Ephesus. The same was said of Apollonius. Both Paul and Apollonius speak of the altar to the god with no name in Athens. Apollonius is a Greek name which when translated to Latin becomes Paulus or Paul. Did the Catholic Church eventually hide the pre-Christian Apollonius, the true original author of the Pauline epistles, behind the name Paul of Tarsus? 
Martin Luther, the creator of Protestantism, stated that Apollonius was the true author of at least one of Paul's epistles. Like the Gnostic Gospels left out of the New Testament, the true epistles of Paul, or Apollonius, relate a story that is mythical, not historical. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Bulls were also sacred in the patriarchal Egypt, and in ancient Persia and Rome, in many statues and paintings, you will see Mithra stabbing the bull, taking humankind out of the age of the bull, or rather, out of the age of Taurus. The stories of the Bible tell us that Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets of the new law on two separate occasions. The first time he came down the mountain with the law, he noticed that his people had fashioned a golden calf and were worshipping it. Moses gets angry with this and throws the tablets against the rocks, literally breaking the law. Sometimes you will find artwork of the Ten Commandments showing the bull in the background with the sun disk between his horns, similar to Apis of Egypt. When Moses and the Jews are blowing the shofar to the heavens in praise, they are using a ram's horn. They are worshipping their Lord by the use of the ram. Moses is often depicted with horns coming out of his head as a representation of Ares, the ram. This head of Moses resembles that of biblical tradition, and biblical tradition reflects the old mystery schools. The wrinkled face and heavy eyebrows, the forehead bearing horns in accordance with the tradition of the mystery play actors. In other words, the story of the sun and stars was kept alive in the mystery schools. One of the characters was Moses, and he represented the ram of Ares by showing him with ram's horns on his head. This filtered down into religious traditions by showing Moses with horns on his head or his followers blowing the ram's horn in worship. This is not some form of devil worship. It is symbolic of the age of Ares. The previous age was Taurus, the bull. This is the bull, or rather the age, which the Moses character was leading his people away from. This age of the ram ended with the slaughter of the ram when Father Abraham, the father of Christianity, slaughtered a ram instead of his son. Just as Mithra kills the bull to usher in the age of the ram, Abraham kills the ram of Ares to usher in the next age, the age of Pisces. Jesus takes us out of the age of Ares into the age of Pisces. And what was his first miracle? He turns regular water into wine and feeds the masses with two fish. These represent the two fish of Pisces. Jesus was the fisher of men. Christians today often put a fish symbol on the back of their car or on their clothes. The Pope's mitre is a fish head, looking exactly like the fish heads, representing the age of Pisces, the age of Christianity, the age of the fish. Hello friends, I'm D.M. Murdoch, also known as Acharya S., author of The Christ Conspiracy, Sons of God, and Who is Jesus? My work was one of the sources for the internet movie Zeitgeist, which has gone viral online with at least 15 million views so far, not only in English, but in several other languages as well. Over the past several months, there have been many claims on websites and in forums and videos all over the internet that the first part of Zeitgeist has been refuted or debunked. Contrary to these claims, 
The facts continue to demonstrate otherwise. Because of my work's influence on part one of Zeitgeist, a number of the debunking sites have been directed largely at me. While we would naturally expect a debate as to the facts, the detractors, whether theists or atheists, quite often have not actually studied my work, and there has not been one refutation site to our knowledge that has proceeded from an informed and unbiased perspective, accurately presenting facts based on serious research. It should be kept in mind that in this short video, I can't cover everything, but I have already written extensively on these subjects, and I have specifically addressed several important issues from Zeitgeist in my companion guide to Part 1, available online right now. Why is the information in Zeitgeist Part 1 not widely known? In the first place, because of blasphemy and heresy laws, in the not-too-distant past, people could lose their jobs, friends, families, or even lives for merely questioning Christian dogma, which caused many people to remain silent on these issues. Also, much of this information can't be found in English, but it appears in other languages, like Greek, Latin, German, French, Sanskrit, Hebrew, and Egyptian. Unless someone can work in other languages, he or she may never encounter these facts. Because of these situations and others, including deliberate censorship by vested interests, many of these parallels between Christ and other gods and goddesses of the ancient world cannot be found in encyclopedia entries, and these seem to be where most of the debunkers are getting their information from, as well as from Christian apologists, whose biases are obvious and well known. In other words, you won't easily find this information in encyclopedias. The subject requires much deeper research than that, and reading encyclopedia entries does not make an expert out of anyone. In addition, these days many scholars are so specialized they don't cover the broad array of subjects involved in this particular field of research. Scholars in past eras were less specialized, and they did in fact make these connections within comparative religion, as my research demonstrates. Furthermore, some of these parallels between Jesus and the other gods represent mysteries in the ancient world that were not to be divulged to the masses. In fact, people were killed for revealing these secrets, such that these mysteries were not readily recorded. Nevertheless, with painstaking research and piecing together, we can present a solid case for all of the important parallels. In my investigation of the Horace Jesus parallels for my companion guide, I incorporate many pre-Christian primary sources, as well as the works of scholars highly credentialed in the appropriate fields. The other correspondences found in Zeitgeist can likewise be backed up with either primary sources or the works of highly credentialed scholars. For example, the parallels between Christ and the god Attis, who was brought up in Zeitgeist, are discussed by Dr. Andrew T. Fear, a professor of classics and ancient history at the University of Manchester in England. In his article, Sybil and Christ, Dr. Fear tells us that Attis was killed and then raised from the dead three days later, during a celebration that depicted him being resurrected out of a tomb, basically at Easter time, precisely as was said of Christ. Also, the idea of the Indian god Krishna's mother being a virgin is not widely known and is therefore said to be wrong. First of all, the virgin birth motif is specifically stated by ancient writers like Philo of Alexandria to be a mystery, as was the goddess who gave birth to a god and yet remained an eternal virgin. And this fact of secrecy explains why these themes are not found all over the place in writing. I have written extensively about Krishna's mother in Sons of God and elsewhere. In my books, The Christ Conspiracy and Sons of God, I also discuss in detail the gods Dionysus and Mithra, who were likewise brought up in Zeitgeist Part 1. Concerning other themes in Zeitgeist, there are many good books on the subject of Old Testament myths, and my book Who Was Jesus goes into greater detail regarding the Joseph-Jesus parallels, as well as the lack of evidence for the historical Jesus. We should keep in mind that shouts for primary sources serve to remind us that Christians went on a rampage to censor and obliterate everything outside of their faith. In fact, these censors destroyed a huge amount of the type of evidence that we're discussing here. 
One straw man argument raised by debunkers concerns the December 25th birth date of various gods, which apologists dismiss by claiming Jesus wasn't really born at that time. However, since the 4th century, when this winter solstice celebration was designated as Christ's birthday, hundreds of millions of people have been taught that December 25th is the date of Christ's birth, and hundreds of millions continue to celebrate that date every year. Indeed, Christian preachers today still insist that Jesus Christ is the, quote, reason for the season, unquote. Furthermore, in 2007, the United States House of Representatives passed House Resolution 847, officially declaring December 25th to be the birthday of Jesus Christ. Raising up this issue of the birthday of the Son, S-U-N, is therefore entirely legitimate. But this assertion that Jesus was not born on December 25th merely proves our point that he is not the reason for the season. Another fallacy concerns the Three Kings comparison, which is dismissed by apologists because nowhere in the New Testament does it mention a number for the wise men who brought gifts to the Christ child. While it is true that the wise men, magi or kings, are not numbered in the New Testament, their gifts are numbered as three at Matthew 2.11, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Also. Christian tradition follows Matthew's suit by numbering the wise men as well, which is why we have a famous Christmas song called We Three Kings. Christian tradition also calls the three king stars in the constellation of Orion the Magi. Much more about all these subjects can be found in my books. Christians, Jews, and Islamists all consider themselves children of the Jewish patriarch Abraham. But the well-hidden fact is that this monotheism does not go back forever and ever, and that the Jewish god Yahweh was originally one of a pantheon of gods. Until recently, biblical archaeology in the Holy Land was deliberately confined to producing only what might confirm the Bible and hiding the rest. But unavoidable discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls have opened the floodgates. Archaeologists are even finding physical evidence proving that Israelites originally worshipped Yahweh along with a wife or consort. Proof that the people of Israel once worshipped their own pantheon of gods is contained in the Bible itself. The biblical words Elohim, Balim, and Adonai refer to plural gods, no matter how many religious translators try to hide them behind a singular word, Lord. The pantheists were strongest in the northern kingdom of Israel and became known as Israelites. There were a number of gods and goddesses in this pantheon. One of the gods was named Shaddai. The sixth chapter of Exodus is used to replace the god Shaddai with the later god Yahweh. The Baal gods mentioned in the Old Testament were worshipped by some of the Israelites. In this passage at Hosea 2.16, the Old Testament writers forcibly changed Baal worship to Yahweh worship. The most high god of the Elohim was El Elyon, or the sun. Among the Israelites, his priesthood was called the Order of Melchizedek. These priests worshipped other gods descended from Elyon, including a god called Moloch, who for a time was considered the same as Yahweh. Moloch worship included human sacrifice, which survived in parts of Israel until it was finally banned under the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Christianity really only began to take hold when it made inroads on the Roman aristocracy. The Emperor Constantine saw the benefit of monotheism and consolidated the Roman Empire under Christianity at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, one of the first attempts to merge the many different Christian sects with the many pagan religions of the time.
Despite this, Constantine himself remained a follower of Saul Evictus, or the Sun, although it's claimed he converted to Christianity on his deathbed. From Constantine onward, remnants of Gnostic Christianity were driven underground. The new Orthodox Christianity was propagated across Europe and Asia Minor by the sword. In 391 AD, the great library at Alexandria was destroyed by the Christian leaders in order to erase Christianity's origins. This was also the beginning of the Christian forgeries and alteration of historical texts, which had come under total church control. Pagan holidays became Christian holidays. Christian churches were built on the sites of pagan temples. Vatican Hill belonged to the god Mithra until 376 AD, when a city prefect suppressed the cult of the rival savior Mithra and seized the shrine in the name of Christ. The archbishop Christostom boasted of this destruction. Some of the Gnostics were bribed into the Orthodoxy with invitations to high positions in the new church. St. Augustine was originally a pagan who converted after the councils in Nicaea. Finally came the notorious Inquisitions beginning in 1184 AD. There is no historical mention of any of the holy sites in Jerusalem being Christian before 326 AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine sent the Christian bishops and his own mother Helena to the Holy Land to find, or as it turned out, invent, the sites described in the New Testament. That these holy sites are of much later date can be proved by examining the writings of the earliest Christians. No early Christian writer states a desire to visit Jesus' hometown of Nazareth or any place that Jesus preached. No early writer longs to see Calvary or the tomb where Jesus miraculously rose from the dead. After the sacking of Rome in 410 AD, the Catholic Church gradually assumed total secular power. The power of the Church became equal to or even above the power of royal families. During this time, the average Christian was not allowed to even read the Bible on pain of torture and death. Only the priests and bishops were allowed to read the original Latin and pass their version of the word on to the Christian followers in the form of sermons. This lasted until the 16th century AD and the Protestant Reformation, when anti-Catholic Christians risked their lives and began printing the Bible in common tongues such as English and German. It was only then, well over a thousand years after the supposed crucifixion of Jesus, that the many discrepancies in the Bible began to be recognized. In the controversial book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, Author John Allegro shows with an astounding attention to detail that the roots of Christianity, and in fact all religious iconography and mythology, can be traced back to one central source. Something not of a different dimension of space and time, not of some extraterrestrial force transcendent of our science and understanding, but of something much more humbled, much more interesting, the Amanita Muscaria Mushroom.
Have you ever wondered why on Christmas we cut down and carry evergreen trees inside our houses, decorate them with fancy ornaments, and place presents underneath them? James Arthur wrote, So why do people bring pine trees into their houses at the winter solstice, placing brightly colored red and white packages under their boughs as gifts to show their love for each other and as representations of the love of God and the gift of his son's life? It is because, underneath the pine bough, is the exact location where one would find this most sacred substance, the Amanita muscaria, in the wild. The Amanita muscaria is the red and white magic mushroom that grows almost exclusively beneath pine trees. Their main psychoactive ingredient is muscamol, as well as trace amounts of DMT, an entheogen naturally produced in the brain's pineal gland. The pine cone-shaped pineal gland is an organ that produces the same DMT found in this pine tree fungus and much more. Dr. Rick Strassman wrote, DMT exists in all of our bodies and occurs throughout the plant and animal kingdoms. It is part of the normal makeup of humans and other mammals, marine animals, grasses and peas, toads and frogs, mushrooms and molds, and barks, flowers and roots. DMT is in this flower here, in that tree over there, and in yonder animal. It is most simply almost everywhere you choose to look. Indeed, it is getting to the point where one should report where DMT is not found rather than where it is. James Arthur wrote, The pine tree is one of the well-known central relics of Christmas. Under this tree is where those who are deemed good find their reward in the form of a present. A big red and white rounded mushroom grows under the very tree we are to look under on Christmas morning to find our gift. Green, red, and white as Christmas colors comes from the evergreen tree and the red and white mushrooms underneath. The word Christmas originally comes from the Egyptian Christ, oiled or anointed one, and mace, the sacred cakes annually made and ingested by the Egyptians. This Eucharist was originally made from Amanita muscaria, or was the mushroom itself. The tradition existed all over the ancient world, but most of the iconography and symbology recognized today comes from pre-Christian Northern Europe. James Arthur wrote, The very name Christmas is a holiday name composed of the words Christ, meaning one who is anointed with the magical substance, and Mass, a special religious service or ceremony of the sacramental ingestion of the Eucharist, the body of Christ. In the Catholic tradition, this substance, body, soma, has been replaced by the doctrine of transubstantiation, whereby in a magical ceremony, the priests claim the ability to transform a cracker or a round wafer into the literal body of Christ. Dana Larson wrote, Although most people see Christmas as a Christian holiday, most of the symbols and icons we associate with Christmas celebrations are actually derived from the shamanistic traditions of the tribal peoples of pre-Christian Northern Europe. The sacred mushroom of these people was the red and white Amanita muscaria mushroom. These peoples lived in dwellings made of birch and reindeer hide called yurts. Somewhat similar to a teepee, the yurt's central smoke hole is often also used as an entrance. After gathering the mushrooms from under the sacred trees where they appeared, the shamans would fill their sacks and return home. Climbing down the chimney entrances, they would share out the mushroom's gifts with those within. Santa also dresses like a mushroom gatherer. When it was time to go out and harvest the magical mushrooms, the ancient shamans would dress much like Santa, wearing red and white fur-trimmed coats and long black boots. To this day, Siberian shamans dress in ceremonial red and white fur-trimmed jackets to gather the magic mushrooms. First, they pick and place the mushrooms to partially dry on nearby pine boughs, which prepares them for ingestion and makes the load lighter. This is why we decorate our Christmas trees with ornaments and bulbs, because the gatherers would always adorn trees with drying mushrooms. Next, the shaman collects his red and white presents in a sack and proceeds to travel from house to house, delivering them. During Siberian winters, the snow piles up past the doors of their yurts or huts, so the red and white clad shaman must climb down the smoke hole or chimney to deliver the presents in his sack. Finally, the appreciative villagers string the mushrooms up or put them in stockings hung afront the fire to dry. When they awake in the morning, their presents from under the pine tree are all dried and ready to eat. Dana Larson wrote, 
The Amanita mushroom needs to be dried before being consumed. The drying process reduces the mushroom's toxicity while increasing its potency. The shaman would guide the group in stringing the mushrooms and hanging them around the hearth fire to dry. This tradition is echoed in the modern stringing of popcorn and other items. James Arthur wrote, The ancient shamanic use of Amanita muscaria in Siberia is well documented. Despite governmental oppression against its use, there are still many who refuse to accept the authorized state religion and continue the shamanic traditions in secret. Just as the Siberian shaman, commonly dressing in red and white, would enter through the opening in the roof of a home where a ritual was to be done, Santa Claus also arrives on the roof and enters through the chimney. Just as the shamans would gather the mushrooms in bags which they would bring with them when performing a ceremony, Santa Claus also, on the holy day, brings presents in a bag. Siberian reindeer also enjoy eating Amanita muscaria mushrooms, and thus are often used as a lure by the deer-herding natives. Since one of the hallucinatory experiences often felt on psychedelic mushrooms is that of flying, Santa's flying reindeer are most likely derived from the this. The high priests of Israel would go out in the morning mist to find the manna from heaven. Those of you who have had the opportunity to study carefully we know that the word manna from heaven actually means mushrooms. The manna from heaven was actually a mushroom, sosilabin, the magic mushroom. And there's many books have been written about the subject of the magic mushroom in the Middle East. And I think we all know that in the Middle East there, had, there is the problem with hashish for thousands of years and the drugs have been uh, floating around the Middle East for thousands of years. Uh, we find it in the Bible, the magic mushroom. Uh, we find in the scriptures that that which is referred to as manna from heaven is a word which means mushroom. Therefore, the high priest of God would go out in the morning, and of course, that's where mushrooms grow, is in the midst, in the dew, in the morning. And they would pick the mushroom the manna from heaven, and of course, consuming the manna from heaven, they began to talk to God. In the book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, Mr. John Allegro, who was commissioned by the State of Israel for research, substantiates the taking of the magic mushroom by the ancient Semitic fertility cults in their sex worship, which predated and influenced modern-day Judaism. As we see pictured here, a, a drawing of the high priest of Israel. This is what the high priest of Israel looked like. You will notice that he is wearing a peculiar headdress. The headdress is because of the manna from heaven that the high priest consumed in their worship. The Hebrew god El was in fact a more ancient Semitic god, Saturn. And that's brought out very well for us here in Archive Orientali. Here we find in this excellent article that the Star of David, the hexagram, is actually the Star of Saturn. And that's why today Hebrews worship on Saturday, Christians worship on the sun's day, God's sun, the light of the world. And there's a uh, there's still a disturbance among uh, religious circles today as to what the uh, correct day of worship is. Is the uh, day Saturday or Sunday? Well, it just depends on whether you're worshiping Saturn, the old ancient Hebrew God, or the Son of God, the light of the world on Sunday. It really doesn't make much difference. It's all Egyptian. If you go back not to the Bible, not to Genesis, but to the most ancient writings in the world, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Rig Veda, you will find that in the ancient nations of the world, they had all the same identical stories. They had the story of the young boy that was swallowed by the great fish because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. They had the story of um, Nemo. The Babylonians had the great lawgiver who had golden hair and went up into the mountain of God. The mountain of God was the pyramid. He went up into the great mountain of God. 
and uh, he received the great law, which becomes known as the law of Hammurabi, the great law of Hammurabi. And that law was given to the Babylonians, say, their great prophet, their great man of God, who went up into the mountains, King Nebo. King Nebo, the great lawgiver who comes down from the mountain with the tablets of stone and gives the great law to the Babylonian people. Now, of course, the Egyptians picked that up, and you will find that in Egyptology, uh, the Egyptians had the same story. But their great lawgivers was called Mises. Mises was the great, wonderful man with beautiful golden hair who went up into the holy mountain, the pyramid, God's holy mountain. And he received the law. And the great law he brought down with the tablets of stone. And when he saw, Mises saw that the Egyptians did not respect the divine law. He broke the, the stones and the great law. Now, of course, the Hebrews, taking that story, moving into uh, Palestine with their worship of their god, El, then comes the story of Moses. Moses is Mises. Mises is Nebo. It's the same story. It never stops. In the Arctic Circle, this fungus also has magical associations with animals. Fly agaric contains hallucinogenic chemicals and is a favorite food of reindeer. For thousands of years, the lives of reindeer and Sami people have been entwined. Fly agaric was important to both of them. In autumn, reindeer seek out the mushrooms, even under an early fall of snow. No one knows whether the reindeer are affected, but in the past, Sami shamans took fly agaric in their visionary rituals. They even drank urine from reindeer, believed to be under the influence. In trance, they contacted the great reindeer spirit. On humans, the drug heightens senses and creates visions of flying. Some believe the greatest of all modern myths arose in the Sami's visionary flights of fancy. Perhaps early 19th century ideas drew on these stories to create a Christmas legend. But it really came home when we walked into uh, St. Mark's uh, Basilica in Venice. Um, it, now, St. Mark's is, a, is an operating cathedral. It's in operation, uh, but it's also a tourist uh, area, and they kind of lead people through like cattle. And uh, if you delay too long and look too long at some of the mosaics, you get people running out from the the arches telling you to move along and so on and so forth. Well, this happened one too many times with us, and uh, my wife got a little bit suspicious, and so we backtracked. And lo and behold, right there was uh, Jesus, and this is on the cover of the failed God book, there was Jesus with the Anamita muscaria mushroom in his hand, surrounded by what appeared to be psilocybin-type mushrooms. Now, when I described this image in my book, I didn't get into a lot of detail because I didn't want to get into a lot of discussions about Adam and Eve and all that business. So I mentioned, you know, male and female that were by the feet of, of Jesus. And uh, as you look at the picture, you see uh, Jesus with a mushroom in his hand and in his left hand. And with his forefinger, he's pointing to his right hand, the hole in his right hand. And then his forefinger in his right hand is pointing to himself. Now, pointing in Christian art is very, very important, as you know, because it tells the, the viewer what to look at and what's significant. And so in that one picture alone, it's telling you that Jesus was the mushroom. Jesus was an experience. He was not 
a real live living human being as far as I can determine there's no evidence for him there's no historical visibility in fact they had to invent that uh, it is no surprise that Nordic Germanic gods have connection to mushrooms in their mythology as Thor throws his mushroom shaped hammer to the ground mighty thunders and lightning cracks cause the real mushrooms to appear as the horses pulling Odin through the sky in his chariot become overexerted, their blood-mingled spit falls to the ground and causes the Amanita mushrooms to grow at those exact points. Probably the first Santa was Osiris in ancient Egypt, who rode his flying chariot to and from the North Pole, was born on December 25th, and celebrated by putting presents underneath an evergreen tree. James Arthur wrote, Not only did Osiris ride the sky in a chariot, but after his death, Isis found that an evergreen, cedar, had grown overnight from a dead stump to full-sized, which was understood as a sign of Osiris's rebirth and immortality. Interestingly, the traditional birth of Osiris is the 25th of December. The 25th of December was also celebrated annually by putting presents around the cedar tree. This tradition is at least 5,000 years old. The birth of Horus to the goddess virgin mother Isis is perhaps the eldest representation of the goddess sun mythology. Yet it is impossible to know this, or the real age of the astrotheological Virgo giving birth to the child god star mythology for sure. However, it is the oldest source I have found. Santa, an anagram for Satan, dresses in red, keeps lists of naughty and nice children, and seems to steal Christmas from Jesus. But if understood in its original mushroom context, Santa's not a conniving, omniscient list-keeper. He's an entheogen, a plant or substance which is said to generate the god within. The word entheogen breaks down en for inside, theo for god, and gen for generate. Generate the god inside. If you have ever taken an entheogen, like psilocybin, DMT, peyote, or ayahuasca, then you are already aware of the spiritual or even religious experiences associated with them. As anyone who has tried them knows, and most anyone who hasn't fiercely denies, these entheogens put us directly in contact with that spark of the divine within ourselves. They allow us access to higher consciousness and open our third eyes. The outer material world dissolves and the five senses return to a state of one sense, one consciousness. James Arthur wrote, First-hand understanding is through the ingestion of the holy substances, of which there has been so much written that this brief expose merely scratches the surface of. It is this direct communal contact which is truly the means whereby a human being can experience his true spiritual nature. One must take very seriously his or her own spirituality, for this is that which we truly are. As I stated in the opening sentence, this experience is of extremely great value, so much so that I feel it necessary to the evolutionary process of each and every individual, and inevitably to all of mankind. If you have mischief, wickedness, or secrecy in you, then entheogens will take you down into the depths of your own hell. But if you have kindness, love, and truth within you, entheogens will raise you up into the heights of that heaven. When people of a poor disposition or in a negative mood eat magic mushrooms, they usually have a bad trip and experience frightening or depressing hallucinations. When people of a good disposition or in a positive mood eat mushrooms, they usually have a great trip and experience hours of uncontrollable laughter and a loving, close feeling with everyone around. Just like at Christmas, Santa keeps lists of children who are naughty and nice, at Easter, only good kids get to eat the colored eggs. This is likely because good kids on mushrooms are hilarious and lots of fun, whereas naughty kids on mushrooms guarantee a bad trip for everyone, so they get coal at Christmas and no eggs at Easter. James Arthur wrote, Santa Claus is an all-knowing icon that reads the hearts and intentions of everyone on the planet. Each child is told the story of the round man who wears red and white and his associates, reindeer, little people, and Mrs. Claus. They are also told the story of a miraculous worldwide flight in a sleigh which results in presents being delivered under a tree. Yet when a child reaches the age of reasoning, he is informed that this story is all a fabrication. This revelation is devastating upon the psyche of a young mind. It is also at this time that the child is often comforted and pacified from the shock by very strong reinforcement that the religious systems which the parents or guardians profess are indeed factual. 
and an attempt is made to incorporate the respective religious traditions into the holiday as the real meaning for the celebration. Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny have both been uprooted from their original positions. They began as mythological mushroom heroes understood in a spiritual context both by children and adults. Now their literal meaning has been suppressed, and a fake image has been corporatized by Coke, Cadbury, and others. The effect this has had is to turn mythological heroes into fantasies and lies. It was not meant for children to discover as they are coming of age that parents, family, and friends have lied to them about Santa and the Easter Bunny. It was meant for them to discover deeper meanings behind the mythologies, such as the ancient astrotheological understanding of the heavens, the knowledge of the zodiacal procession, the seasonal cycles like solstices and equinoxes, the whole complexity of the modern Christmas mythos is an unexplainable mess without the magic mushroom. The story is completely unintelligible. Dana Larson wrote, Some psychologists have discussed the cognitive dissonance which occurs when children are encouraged to believe in the literal existence of Santa Claus, only to have their parents lie revealed to them when they are older. By so deceiving our children, we rob them of a richer heritage. Many people in the modern world have rejected Christmas as being too commercial, claiming that this ritual of giving is actually a celebration of materialism and greed. Yet, the true spirit of this winter festival lies not in the exchange of plastic toys, but in celebrating a gift from the earth, the fruiting top of a magical mushroom, and the revelatory experiences it can provide. Instead of perpetuating outdated and confusing holiday myths, it might be more fulfilling to return to the original source of these seasonal celebrations. How about getting back to basics and enjoying some magical mushrooms with your loved ones this solstice? What better gift can a family share than a little piece of love and enlightenment? I'm puzzled. Uh, are you really seriously suggesting that Jesus Christ was a mushroom? Uh, put pretty blankly, yes. Surely you don't suggest that Jesus Christ and his various disciples were not human creatures? Yes. You are dealing with a, a secret cult, a secret society. The stories of the New Testament contain certain incantations certain magic names were which were really the names of mushrooms no but and the writers the writers matthew mark luke john these men who wrote the mm. story you are telling me they did not exist no, no. none of them exist no. it, it's part of mythology it's part of mushroom mythology what i see with the jesus story is a very old powerful beautiful gnostic myth an initiatory allegory about gnosis which starts as wisdom sayings and a basic myth which becomes fleshed out and put into a geographical and a historical setting. And at some point there are some serious political overlays which will benefit the uh, Roman world. So that when it becomes the property of the Roman Empire, uh, it can manipulate it to its own ends. We've been so conditioned to think of paganism as some benighted superstition. And then along comes this incredible revelation of Christianity. The truth is much better. Actually, the ancient world was full of everything. You think of it a bit like you know, India or somewhere maybe today. You know, you've got every form of thing happening. But within it, you've got this incredibly powerful philosophical tradition. I mean, don't forget, the ancient world gave us mathematics, science, uh, architecture. I mean, this is a high culture. And therefore, no surprise that its spirituality is also highly developed. And that's what... Once you understand that, you can see that, that it's, not, it's not to belittle Christianity. It's actually to make a link back to its very beautiful, powerful, profound ancient heritage. And then Christianity takes on a new shape and form. It's not this thing which replaces something, it's like a flowering of something. I think there's two things that need to happen in spirituality. One is we need to go back like psychotherapy and sort out the past, get clear, realize that we've kind of been caught up in false memory syndrome. We haven't seen the way things actually were. And then we can let go of literalism. We can let go of blind belief that somebody did it for us. The idea, the horrendous idea, that if you don't believe this, you'll be tortured forever when you die by a god of love. You know, this crazy stuff. And instead move into a new form of experiential, direct experience. Now, the Gnostic tradition was elitist 
in the past. It was for the few. I think what's happening now is it's, it's not like that. This is available for more and more people. The, more and more people spontaneously and naturally are having this awakening occur. And we are continuing a evolutionary current of which the ancient pagans, the Pythagoreans were a part, the ancient Egyptians were a part, the Gnostics were a part, and it's come through and we're still continuing that thread today. And if we can honor that thread and make that journey, then we can create a more loving and a more unified world.